Martha Marchese, welcome to Listing with Leaders. You are the CEO of JK Design and can be found at jkdesign.com. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Well, first of all, tell us a little bit about your backstory. Absolutely. I have been in advertising my entire career. Uh, I started about 40 years ago and I've been on the agency side ever since. I was really fortunate. I was uh, lucky to land my dream job as a junior copywriter on Madison Avenue. Uh, my kids still can't believe that I lived in New York City on $14,000 a year, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> and I was very fortunate. I worked at a lot of really great shops, uh, Young and Rubicam, Saatchi and Saatchi, Gray, uh, Della Femina. I, was, I worked for one of the original Mad Men, Jerry Della Femina. Uh, wow. Well, I, I was very fortunate. I did a lot of great work and a lot of great brands and rose up through the creative ranks and creative and strategy just kind of went hand in hand. And I found I love both. And about 11 years ago, I came to JK as the chief strategy officer. And about four years ago, I was appointed CEO. And I am grateful to helm such a wonderful agency as JK. Amazing. So tell us about JK and what it does. Sure. We have been in business about 38 years. Uh, we started out, obviously, our, our JK Design, we started out grounded as a design agency, and we have blossomed into a full-service creative and communications agency. Uh, I'm proud to say we're women-owned. We've been uh, women-owned for two years now, so that's really uh, an accomplishment. We are headquartered in central New Jersey. We are about 50 people. We have stayed uh, that size quite deliberately because we think it provides a level of really great service. Um, we have two core service lines, branding and messaging and corporate communications, and we work across uh, B2C, B2B, B2E, uh, all across all the audiences. Uh, we're industry agnostic. I, think it, I don't think at this point there's a, a vertical we haven't worked in, but I think if you ask me to sum up JK in a sentence, I would tell you that we are expert storytellers. That's what we do. There you go. And, and, and what, what, what kind of clients do you represent? Oh gosh, all kinds of clients from startups to big global brands. Uh, we, we've had a 20 plus year relationship with one of the largest uh, healthcare concerns in the world, all the way down to you know medical device startup. And I, I've learned a lot about gastro surgery. So all kinds of, all kinds of clients across all sizes and all spectrums. And why do, why do people come to JK Design? I think they come to JK Design because A, we're great storytellers, and B, I think we really know what it takes from research through execution to really bring a story to life, bring a strategy to life, and make sure that it's successfully communicated out there. And uh, we we have a, lo a, lot of, a lot of proof around that and a really good track record. So I think clients come to us knowing we deliver because we know how to do it. And what gets you excited in the morning? I love telling stories. <laughs> I have always loved telling stories. And so for me, a new challenge, uh, you know, I, I had, I did a lot of consumer work and it's easy when you're handed a, a million dollar budget and say, go shoot this big television campaign. That's fun, but it's also a lot easier than being in a new space with a limited budget, trying to make dollars go far and, and figure out how to gain a, a louder voice in that sandbox. So the challenge is new and different every day. And I find the B2B space absolutely fascinating. So the, um, and what's interesting to me is there is so much noise out there and punching through the noise is yeah. the big challenge, getting people to pay attention. And, and I, I don't know about you, but I've observed over my career that the attention span has gone from the attention span of a fly to the attention span of a gnat. It sure has. It sure has. And, you know, yes, it's more challenging than ever because that white noise is, is white hot noise. I agree. Uh, but, you know, I was thinking about it in advance of talking to you today. And I thought, look, we're storytellers and what makes for a really authentic story. Our, and our authentic stories are the ones that cut through. Authentic stories that sound real, feel real. They're the ones that cut through. And I think it's three things. One is obviously you have to have a smart strategy. You have to know the message that you wanna say and know who you wanna say it to and how you're gonna get it out there. I think the other big thing is emotion. You've got to connect emotionally. You know, we do, as I said, we do a lot of work in the B2B space. You know, I was reading an interesting stat recently that said 70% of all B2B purchase decisions are emotionally driven. And that's in the B2B space. I'm going to, it's 100%. 100%. That's, that's right. what neuroscience tells us. There's no such thing as a rational decision. Every yeah, decision is emotional. 
I, I agree with that. I, I will, even though the stat said 70, I agree with you, I will up it to a few. <laughs> we know is that emotion matters. And so what's the third fundamental to creating an authentic story? It's listening, because you've got to listen to how the people who matter feel, what makes them tick, how are they feeling? And if you don't gain that insight and that understanding, there's no way you're ever going to create a truly authentic story. That's amazing that you've come to that insight. Um, in my work as a lawyer turned peacemaker, I've learned that all conflict is emotional. Mm -hmm. And if you don't listen to the emotions, you have no no hope of bringing no. them to the table. And, no. and to your point, if you don't tell an emotional story and connect with people emotional emotionally, they're not going to connect. They're not going to pay attention. Nope, they're not. You know, I'll tell you a, a cute story. Many, many years ago, I was working uh, for a very large grocery chain who will go unnamed. And that grocery chain knew their audience. And at the time, the, the primary audience, although it's very dri different today, many years ago, it was primarily working moms. That was their primary audience. And they said they knew their audience better than anybody else. Oh, they did. Absolutely. And so we developed this entire campaign that said to these working moms, we got you, we'll, we take care of everything. We'll take care of the school lunches. We take care of the dinners. We take care of the birthday parties, the soccer parties, big, big campaign. And they tested it and it bombed. Mothers actually got mad. They said, you don't take care of my family. I take care of my family. Who are you? And guess what? We relaunched it as a new campaign called Help. And we help you take care of your family. <laughs> well, there you go. It was uh, it was an assumption, and it wasn't based on truly understanding their audiences and what made them tick. And the emotion was not the one that they hoped for because they told a highly inauthentic story to a target audience. Yeah. So when you're when your team is working on building a story and you're trying to create this emotional component, how do you how do you ascertain what what you think the emotional components are going to be? What the what the it's either appetitive or aversive, right? So how do you, and you want to draw people in. So how do you, how do you figure that out? Well, you have to do really good research. You know, you have to do focus groups. You have to do surveys. You have to do one-on-one -on -one interviews. You have to get to the heart of what it is that matter. And again, clients can make a lot of assumptions, but when you challenge those assumptions, it starts at the very, it starts at the very beginning of the process. It doesn't even start with customers. It starts with the client. Um, and I'll say it's important to listen between the lines, not just read between the lines, but listen between the lines. Uh, I can't tell you how many times a client will come to us and they'll say, we need to do this campaign or we have to create this tactic or this digital strategy. And when you start to probe and you start to listen between the lines and you start to talk about the pain points and the challenges and why they're asking for this. And when you start to unpack the why, I can't tell you how many times at the end of that listening, we will we'll recommend a, something, a solution that is entirely different than the original ask. And we know it's gonna be more effective because we took the time to really listen to what was going on and we can create a solution that ends up being far more effective for our clients. Pass that down the chain, they then have to take the time time to really listen to their audiences, do the research, uh, test the, you know, test the hypotheses. And from there, then they can build an authentic message. So how, it starts with the client and then it goes right, right through to the target audiences. How do the clients like that process? I think they like it very much because they, there's a, a comfort in knowing you're going to hit the mark. There's, as we talked about a few minutes ago, this white hot noise, you've got one chance to put a message out there and have it resonate. You know, you, there's no, there's no, you know, backup position there. So I think that there's a comfort in knowing you've taken the time to really figure out what it is you want to do. And then you've taken the time to really understand that the story you're putting out there is the right one. So I think, I think it, it doing your homework really, it's, it is so critical today. Absolutely. You know, uh, uh, there are many parts of our culture that think that emotions, see emotions as being toxic. Emotions are bad, emotions are evil, emotions make you weak. Um, do you run across clients that ha hold that attitude and, and don't understand the power of emotions in storytelling? Yes, we do, especially in the B2B side. I, I don't think it's, I, I don't think you find it as often on the consumer side, right. but the B2B side tends to, tends to be, kind of have a bit more of that rational mindset, if you will. So we do. 
we we really do. But I, you know, the the re, we use a lot of research too. There are a lot of stats out there that help support what we're talking about. And you know, it's the I think the proof is in the stories we built on the B two B side that are highly emotional and highly effective. And so we use that as kind of our calling card to say we know this works. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing less of it. I, I think, as you said, I, I think. Emotion is so necessary across everything that there's there's um, there's just more open armed feeling about using it and leveraging it even on the B two B side. Hmm. So what is it that's unique that you bring to the table? What's unique about you that you bring to the table? You know, I, I think one of my biggest qualities is my ability to listen, whether it's to teammates, team members, uh, whether it's to our leadership team. Uh, I think I'm really good at listening between the lines. And I'll tell you another thing that I think I'm really good at. I listen for the silence. I think that is so important to listen for the silence because sometimes what's not being said is just as important as what's being said. And I see that with my own employees. Uh, you know, we do a ton of branding work and we have these very interactive sessions. And I am always watchful for the people who are not talking. Are they being overshadowed or intimidated by a louder voice in the room or a more senior voice? Are they hesitant to voice their own perspectives and opinions? And I will, I will call those, call out those people, have them stand because every stakeholder needs to be heard. And ironically, sometimes when that happens, those quiet people end up being some of the most verbal. So I think it's so important to listen for the silences because they they tell you just as much as the people who are who are who have no problem talking. So I, I've gotten really good at that. Good. Um, yeah, you, you've developed a technique that I teach in leadership, which is um, in any given group, you've got 50% of the people are extroverts, and 50% of the introverts. Mm -hmm. And you've got to give the introverts space to be able to talk. And you have to create safety for them to talk. And you really, many times, you have to shut down the introverts. Yeah. In order for the introverts to feel comfortable speaking, because when they do speak, often their their thinking is very deep. And you can get sometimes the most insightful. I couldn't agree with you. And they are sometimes the most insightful. And they just need they they just need the launch pad. And right. the, sometimes the launch pad is, and I can tell sometimes when I call on someone who's quiet, you can see at first, they're like, oh, damn, she called me. But then, <laughs> then once they start to talk and again, listening to what they have to say and giving them that forum, um, they provide incredibly valuable insights and opinions and perspectives. So, so I've gotten really good at that and noticing where this, when and where those silences happen. It, the other thing I think is important is that when you do get those people talking, that you make sure there's no judgment or criticism by the extroverts, because they'll tend to jump in and say, oh, you're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. That's just the most idiotic thing I've ever seen. Got to stop that. I do. I, I, I'm, I'm good at shutting those conversations down. <laughs> Very good. Yes. I, I run a tight ship, but I, um, you know, the other thing too that I have seen is while it's so important in the consumer or customer space, it's also so important on the employee side of things, you know, uh, making sure employees feel heard, uh, especially with uh, the talent landscape the way it is today. You know, we, we do a lot of work on, on the employee side and making sure employees have a voice is is so critical. And we really help companies see that, that you've got to have a dialogue direct to employees. You've got to have a response mechanism. Um, we, we just completed um, a, a research study and we did it on Glassdoor. And it was really interesting because we looked at the 10 top ranked companies. And what we saw was that the word feedback was mentioned almost 10 times more by employees at the top ranked companies than it was at the mid ranked companies. Hmm. Employees mentioned it in terms of having a dialogue and getting feedback on my performance or employees, employers acting on feedback that I've given to them. It, it, was, it was just telegraphic in that it showed how important listening is and that when employees feel heard, they feel valued. Absolutely. And when they feel valued, they feel motivated, and it, it can lead to better engagement, better retention, and frankly, just a richer culture. So we see that, and, and it's just, it's so, so critical to create the dialogue and keep the feedback loop open all the time. 
I call that listening other people into existence. Yes, yes, you do. I yes, you do. Listening into his existence. I, I read about that. There are so few people who have ever felt deeply heard. I mean, it's amazing. Here we we all interact, we come to work, we do our thing, and yet people still feel ignored and un undervalued and not appreciated and supported and not heard. Yeah. 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 It's the simplest gift in the world. It sounds so easy. And so you would think everyone would do it all the time. We're not trained, we're not trained in how to do it. And so we don't. And yet the yet the results are so profound. Yep. People feel deeply validated. They will follow you anywhere. It's so true. Uh, you know, I we I stress the importance of listening to our employees at JK. And we do we run workshops and we run workshops and we focus on those learned skills, things like better presentation skills or more effective writing skills. Mm -hmm. But then we also focus on what I call earned skills, skills that earn you the trust and respect of other people. And listening is an earned skill. Absolutely. I, you know, we talk about the fact that there is such a big difference between listening to somebody versus waiting for them to shut up so you can talk, right? right? Such a big difference. And that when you, when the person you're talking to really believes that you're listening and you're playing back what they're saying to you, so they know you're listening, they feel valued. And, and that to me, I think that kind of skill has a direct link to empathy and being empathetic, which is another earned skill. And so it helps, you know, we're a highly collaborative culture and I see the difference when people feel that, you know, other colleagues and peers are truly listening to them, that it just validates that they're, that they matter. And so we really work on it. Uh, that's great. I mean, empathy really is uh, emotional listening. Empathy is the ability to, to um, read, interpret, assimilate, and reflect back the emotional experience of another person. And that requires emotional listening, which is a skill that is very rarely taught. But when you when you when you do that, you get this profound connection that we're talking about. I'm curious about you're the C CEO. Um, when you think about your management team, the people that work with you, how, how much training or how much emphasis do you give to them on learning how to listen? Oh, quite a bit. No, oh, and leadership training is so important to, you know, they to be effective managers, they have to know, you know, it's not something that some people, yes, for some people it's more innate than others, but what does it mean to be an empathetic leader? How do you demonstrate that? You know, what do you, how, the art of having a difficult conversation. We all right. have to have difficult conversations. I usually get the lion's share, but <laughs> we all have difficult conversations. And how do you handle those conversations with grace and empathy? And so that there's a resolution and you've and yet you've you've managed to do it in a way that's that's good for both sides. And it's it is it's a skill that takes a lot of work. It really does. I, I talk about taking transforming difficult conversations. And when I, I facilitate difficult conversations, I actually facilitate difficult conversations for free for people. And I've had some pretty heavy, I mean, about as bad as you could possibly think between. I can only imagine. <laughs> um and what I tell my clients is that this is not an exercise in talking. This is not an exercise in conversation. This is an exercise in listening. Yeah. You're going to do far more listening than you are going to be doing talking. And what they experience is this, that suddenly this person that where there's in some cases, some pretty horrible stuff has happened. And now they're validating each other at a deep level, their emotional experiences. And that's when the magic happens. Yeah, you are so right. And it, and it's hard to do. It's hard to really listen. Um, I have a, a leader who is just a phenomenal leader. And she and her team were involved in a project. And the client got pretty brutal. A lot of screaming and yelling on the calls. And it was tough. And what she did to her team was she said, I know you hear screaming and yelling. I'm hearing a really stressed client who has an incredible amount of pressure on her shoulders right now and is really, this, this has to look good for her. And I'm hearing that stress and pressure. So let's honor that, let's support her. 
and they stayed calm and cool and they, they didn't get rattled and they got the job done. And do you know that afterwards, that client wrote a, an email to the team and apologized and said, I, I know I took it all out on you and I was stressed and I was upset. And the fact that this leader heard that, that she listened and that's what she heard and she instructed her team to not be mad, to, but to lift this client up, that's a, that's a powerful leader. And I was so proud of her and her ability to listen effectively to that client. What she did was um, at, a, at, at a level, it's called affect labeling. And there's brain science that shows, brain scanning studies starting in 2007 from Matthew Lieberman's lab at UCLA, that when you have somebody like your client who is really emotionally um, intense, that when you at, label the emotions, the emotional centers of the brain are, are inhibited while the right ventral lateral prefrontal cortex is activated. And you can literally calm somebody down in 90 seconds or less. That's why my, my fourth book is called that. It's based on that based on that science. And she did exactly the right thing. She said, I'm hearing stress, I'm hearing anger, I'm hearing fear, I'm hearing frustration. And the next step would be to actually call it out. So you would say, I, I would be, be training people to say something like, um, Ms. Klein, you are really angry, you're really frustrated, and you're really, really worried. And you don't feel like you're being heard, and you don't feel like you're being appreciated and supported right now. And this is really stressful for you. And you say something like that, immediately calms down, and then you can move into the problem solving. Yeah. So that's. No, I, I I was reading about your work, and I I I saw that you make it you focus. It's not the I hear this. Oh. It's it's just yes. And I subscribe to that philosophy a thousand percent. Yeah. You know, it, it, even in our story telling a you focus message resonates a lot more than a we or I focus message so rather than telling me what you think of my emotions you're simply honoring my emotions yeah exactly. absolutely and and, and I, I have to tell you Martha you're a rare person not many people get that uh, <laughs> that all came from the work of Thomas Gordon in the 1950s he was the one that coined the term active listening and he was a he was a student of Carl Rogers, the great humanist psychologist. And everybody has misconstrued his work for now 60, 70 years. And uh, it we can't get it out. It's like Freudian stuff is all wrong. We can't get Freud out of our culture either. We can't get this active listening crap to go away either. I mean, I teach I teach at the I'm a graduate professor at the Strauss Institute of Dispute Resolution at the Pepperdine School of Law. And I still have my colleagues teaching students. In mediation classes to use I statements and not you statements. And I just shake my head. Wow. It's one of those things you just can't, it's so entrenched. You, you, even though the science says don't do this, people okay. will still do okay. it. But that's right. I mean, you're absolutely right. When 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 I'm working in prisons training inmates how to be peacemakers, what we always tell them is you all we have you have to listen from the speaker's frame of reference. And the only way you can do that is with the you statement. Yeah. And they get yeah. it. And they get it. It's, okay. it's looking. It, it's it is looking through the lens from the other point of view, and it's 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 critical to our work to understand the people we're talking to and how best to have a dialogue with them. And it it's a lesson that you can take through professional life, personal life, That's to right. look through the lens of the other side. And it's powerful. It's really powerful. Uh, I'm curious. How, this is kind of changing topics a little bit. How do you guys think AI is going to change your business? I was just on a podcast earlier about AI and marketing. <laughs> I'm just curious. And I, no, and you know, there's of course there's a lot of fear about AI replacing what we do as storytellers, and I I completely disagree. I think it's going to help us. It's going to help us tell better stories. I think used properly, I think it can be a big resource. Big resource in terms of helping to spark an idea, helping to create the, the bones of a new concept that you build off of. So I think if it's used correctly, I think it can be not just an asset to us on the agency side of things, but to help our clients be better marketers. Yeah. But I think, it, I think it involves two things. I think it involves a heck of a lot of learning, hence 
the podcast I was just on and I'm going to sign up for their, their, their course because I think you've got to understand the tools, really how they work, where they can be applied so that you can leverage them for both yourselves as a business and the clients you do business with. I was I, I played around with chat GPT last fall when it first came out and it got all the answers wrong. Yeah. But recently, um, I've got a colleague of mine who's a Silicon Valley tech startup guy, and he showed me, he said, no, 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 you got to use it this way. And I, we started playing with it, and I was astounded at how powerful it was. That's it. Use correctly. It, 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 there are some, there are power tools, but That's I also think going hand in hand, and I know as an agency, we are developing our own policy, that po policing it and knowing the policy behind how to use it ethically and effectively is, is at the top of the list. That's right. And the, and, the, and the other thing, we've been talking about emotions. One thing that people don't realize is, is AI will never, at least as far as I can tell, at least in my lifetime, artificial intelligence, a computer system is never going to have emotion. Yep. And it's emotions that make us human. Yep. It's emotions yep. that make us connect. And the, and the tools like ChatGPT can help us yes. understand how to explore and express, but the actual understanding the emotional experience comes down to the human brain. It does, it does. So I, I, think it's, I think there's a lot of um, misinformation around AI. I think there's a lot of uncertainty and fear around it, but I believe that if we understand it and learn it and police it, we can really harness the power of it in a really positive way. Yeah, That's I, I agree. Um, yeah, I was I was skeptical in the fall. I'm now coming around to seeing the power of it. But to your point, we've got to police it and be disciplined with it. It's yes. not you can just willingly willy use and expect it to do miracles. No, you cannot. Going on, you know, WebMD does not make you a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> It's, we've got to know how to use it and how to use it the right way, for sure. It's a tool just like any other tool. Yep. Well, we've come to the end of the 30 minutes. I always like to, to finish with one last question. And that is, Martha, what is one thing about you that we would never know unless you revealed it to us? Oh, Let's see, I will not make it, we've talked, we've talked uh, a lot about business, which has been absolutely wonderful. So I think I'm gonna go the personal route on this one. Uh, I am, I've, I'll give you three, three fun facts about me. I am a hardcore popcorn addict. I can say the alphabet backwards. Wow. And I have, I have met and shake, I shook hands with the Dalai Lama. Those are my three big things. Wow, I'm impressed with all of those. <laughs> <laughs> well, backwards, backwards usually takes a glass of wine but i can do it <laughs> well thank you so much for your time today martha i've really enjoyed the conversation it's been a pleasure thank you so much for for having me and again i just want to say you have a remarkable story a remarkable story i i so i'm the work you do in prisons is just powerful and i admire it and i really love the way you are teaching people to listen on a very deeply emotional level. Well, thank you.